Well, I've been a um, huge Lovecraft fan all my life. I got um, indoctrinated into his weird world by my mother, who was a fan herself and um, read me her work, Lovecraft's work when I was probably around seven or eight years old and then grew up into a precocious 13-year-old who was already trying to um, turn some of the stories into Super 8 movies. And really it was simply because um, the um, Lovecraft's um, creative universe is in such a mess that um, the um, copyright is now in public domain, uh, which enabled me to stroll in there and um, adapt one of the, um, the main short stories pretty much before anyone else noticed that the, um, that the material was actually um, free for all. I've always wanted better Lovecraft adaptations. And uh, one of the ironies is I think that um, the man's influence has been str on um, the rest of the genre has been so incredibly strong. There's so many people like um, Stephen King or um, John Carpenter who um, kind of tip their hats to Lovecraft that um, there's movies like Carpenter's um, The Thing which um, skewer the themes and the, the mood really perfectly without being um, legitimate Lovecraft adaptations. And I also think that there's Lovecraftian moments in um, Art House Cinema, which occasionally almost press the right buttons for me, like I love it in Bergman's um, Winter Light when the lady has a vision of God as a huge spider which is scuttling down to eat her. Um, there's moments in some of the Tarkovsky movies in Stalker and Solaris, which also um, give me the heebie-jeebies. But um, not a lot of, in terms of official adaptations, that's really gone after the, um, the, the core issues, the, um, the cosmic horror within the material. Yeah, and the thing's an awesome example of it. It's one of the, the, one of the bleakest sci-fi movies ever and just the best monster ever. Yeah. And I think sets a very, very high bar for, um, for this kind of movie. We were looking all, always to try and find some kind of sweet spot between um, practical effects and, and VFX. I don't like to have things which are totally happening in camera and prefer to, as much as possible to um, do things um, live on the floor, which um, is a pretty old-fashioned approach now, but I think it pays dividends. Um, I, was, I was pretty bullish about um, simply going after um, the, um, the basic concept. Um, there was a point about six months before we started shooting when Annihilation came out where everyone kind of did a double take and went, oh no. And I thought, okay, I'm just going to ignore this and um, continue. There have been a lot of other um, stealth Lovecraft adaptations in the last year. Annihilation's got a lot of color out of space's DNA in it. And um, Cthulhu showed up in underwater most recently. And um, there's tentacles all over the lighthouse. So there have been a few um, stealth Lovecraft pieces, but um, this was a, an official entry. And um, part of my mission statement was to try to um, reclaim Lovecraft's old ones, his ultra-dimensional um, alien deities, and try to um, make them into a, um, a clear and present threat for um, the 21st century. So that also entailed, I guess, um, updating the material and trying to um, yeah, reposition it, because I think Cthulhu's gotten too, gotten too cuddly over the last few years. Yeah, we tried applying a lot of mad science to the material. So the um, color scheme is um, drawn from the notion that the human visual spectrum, our visual range, exists between ultraviolet on the one end and um, infrared on the other. Um, magenta, which becomes almost a sort of default color for the movies, kind of a, a neural bridge between the two. There's some wags out there that say that magenta doesn't really exist, but um, it's ki it kind of ended up being our main color. Essentially, if anything's going to bust into our world, into our, into our dimension, it, a field has to come from somewhere. And it's going to come in through either ultraviolet or infrared, just the same as if a, a sound is going to enter into one's consciousness. It's going to come in through either ultrasound or infrasound. It's going to either be a, a high-pitched whine that gradually comes d dips down into our audio range, or um, a deep bassy rumble, or which, which gradually comes up into into our range. So I figured. Um, we're pushing all the time into those areas, into ultrasound and infrasound, and at the same time pushing into infrared and ultraviolet to try and give a sense of something which was um, sort of chafing against the outer limits of um, what we could really perceive. Yeah, I wanted it to be something that you would feel with one's diaphragm almost, um, rather than rationally process, because 
all the while I'm thinking that the thing itself is really beyond our, our, our perception. And, um, just to give us the sense of what it's like to um, be in the presence of something which is um, yeah, utterly I inhuman and um, beyond our, um, our three dimensions. Well, I'm definitely still a bit of a punk at heart, so uh, my interests tend towards the, um, the shock and awe. Um, I, I, I do like to make um, left of field um, plot decisions, where, and, and I hope that the audience can't easily see where the, um, the movie is going from the, um, the first 20 minutes. No, I mean, Nick's totally spot on and when, he's when he says he's talking about his working method. He um, sat down about two months in advance and um, highlighted different areas of the script where he felt he could um, really let go. And, um, right from the top, fixated on the um, freaking out in the car and the, um, the tomato sequence, the couple of moments in the film where he felt he could um, really push it further. And, um, we were just concerned to... Um, kind of dial him back in the, um, in the first third and um, have Nick in something closer to um, his um, old-fashioned romantic um, sort of um, light comedy leading man uh, mode and then have him gradually shifted to, um, into full-on full um, hysteria. And um, me and Nick share, a, um, I think, a penchant for, um, for deadpan um, apocalyptic comedy, and I, I like what Nick does, and it, it fits very well into um, my normal worldview. Um, so we're currently prepping on um, the second one, which is a, a new adaptation of the Dunwich Horror, which um, is another reason why the first 20 minutes of um, colour are um, quite slow and sedate, because um, it's going to be Act 1 and a um, a nightmarish trilogy. And we're going to do um, t three of the um, the main stories, but I want to do them in roughly sequential order, so the next one's set in the um, the same backwards location, um, approximately seven years later. And, um, it's still going to be a, a, a MAGA era, um, sort of immediately post-Trump um, apocalyptic um, New England setting. And, um, it'll. Um, yeah, hopefully I'll um, roll from there. I'm very much hoping that by the time we get to the third movie, we'll, um, be ha we'll have um, the necessary budget to um, be able to truly bring on the old ones. Um, my main um, goals on the, fo the project was to humanize the um, Lovecraft's characters. Um, Lovecraft was so I is so inhuman himself. He has very little interest in um, three-dimensional um, human beings, who always seem sort of incidental in the in the basic story. So I figured one of the w things I was going to do with it was to try and um, have a bit more of an argument with him by um, presenting him with um, real humans. I thought, what if it's my own family? What if it's my own mother or my own children that are being um, obliterated by the ultra-dimensional um, alien threats? So. Um, that was a deliberate um, move to try and um, counter his um, existential bleakness by um, introducing some level of, um, of love and humanity into the... Yeah, and I guess on that level it contains some sort of creepy Spielberg DNA. DNA. It starts out looking like it might want to g um, go down a poltergeist um, ET route, but then of course you realize it's not going... This isn't the... Um, the 70s and the 80s anymore, and the, the guard, the family's, family's survival chances are, are pretty much zero in color. But at some point, I just uh, opted not to bother trying to um, explain any of it to the audience. Um, you can, uh, I guess, um, go to Wikipedia afterwards, and I'd encourage people to look into um, the, uh, the human visual spectrum and the, uh, the idea that there's all kinds of stuff going on in this world that we simply can't perceive. But, um, Having some character waffle on about it for um, a couple of minutes would probably have um, slowed it down too much. But um, I hope over the course of the, um, the next two movies I'll get a chance to um, broaden the universe somewhat. There's also an awful lot of um, stuff which is inspired by um, accounts from um, UFO um, contactees and people who have had um, traumatic um, otherworldly experiences which um, lost time, lost memories, a sense of yeah, um, space-time distortion, 
um, olfactory distortions, smelling strong sweet smells or strong um, bitter sulfurish smells, which are also a fingerprints hallmarks of um, something which is um, messing with one's perception, even if one can't actually see what it is. So a lot of those ideas I pulled in from different um, different people's accounts, but um, I prefer to leave it up to the audience to um, make up their own minds about it. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys! Hey You Guys, huh? Hey you guys, is that yeah. from the Goonies? It is indeed, yeah. Nice. Hey You Guys!